Hey guys, so this is going to be the third episode in my list of top 10 favorite Shakespeare plays, and we are now at number four, which, you know, you read the title, so you know what it is. It's The Tempest. So this play is one that I started reading when I was 13. I had just started reading Shakespeare, and so this was the second one I read, actually. I read it on my own. Um, I was able to study it again later in grade 12 in, in an actual more official capacity in my school, but the actual text, the first time I read it, was when I was 13. This one is very, very interesting. What kind of pulled me into it was the fact that it's very much a fantasy, or at least by modern standards I would say it is. In Shakespeare's time that wasn't a genre, so it's kind of... It's categorized in that nebulous state that's kind of in between tragedies and comedies, because it does deal with a lot more serious stuff and, and, and doesn't have a lot of the hallmarks of being a comedy, but it also, spoiler alert, um, has a happy ending, which of course means it can't be a tragedy. So it tends to fall into a group that has kind of multiple names and isn't really categorized as neatly as the others in Shakespeare's canon. This group of plays commonly consists of the plays that he wrote in the later era of his career and tends to deal with, with slightly different themes and tones than a lot of his earlier work does. I have most commonly heard them referred to as late plays, which is what I'm going to call them, but I've also heard people call them romances, tragic comedies, even fairy tales at times. So late plays is what I'll be saying, but just so you know, this play is quite unique in terms of categorization in Shakespeare. So the plot of The Tempest is that a group of nobles, and well, one king, so nobles and royalty, are stranded on an island after a tempest wrecks their ship. And it turns out that there is a magician living on this island with his daughter. The magician's name is Prospero, and that he actually created the Tempest with the help of some of his, I guess, spirit servants. The, most, the one we see the most of, of is Ariel. And Ariel gives a very direct um, description of the Tempest and kind of what it was like for her. Ariel is kind of, to me, Ariel almost seems like a dark and gritty reboot version of Puck, <laughs> because she definitely has a lot of the traits of Puck. She's a bit of a trickster. She clearly likes to mess with the humans, but she is ultimately good at heart. However, she has a very sad backstory. Um, I'm not going to say too much about that, but let's just say that Puck, uh, um, yeah, very, very happy life compared to what Ariel has. Oh my goodness. Yeah, pretty much from the first scene you meet Ariel, it's like, someone needs to, like, I don't want to say give this poor per this poor being a hug because Ariel doesn't have a body, so she can't really hug you, but, you know, so, the, whatever the equivalent of that would be. So Prospero has decided that he needs to wreck this ship on this island because it turns out that he is actually the rightful Duke of Milan, and his daughter Miranda, who's with him, is his heir. They are living on this island because 12 years ago his brother teamed up with the king of Naples to usurp him and they had the two of and they had Prospero and his daughter left on a boat and kind of sent out to sea to die. They and they landed on this island. And of course, the people who were shipwrecked on the island include his brother and the king of Naples and a whole bunch of other people who are close to them like the king of Naples' brother, um, the king's son, a couple of other nobles, there's a bunch of other people as well. So the idea that Prospero has is they're all here, they're on this island, they don't know I'm here, I am now a powerful magician, I've got complete control over this situation, I can do whatever I want. So it seems like it's going to be a typical revenge story, but honestly it's actually the story of forgiveness. Yes, there is a lot of revenge in it, don't get me wrong, but kind of the conclusion that Prospero comes to in this play is that he needs to forgive which is an interesting concept for a play like this. It's quite different from a lot of Shakespeare's earlier works, and I really find it interesting and I love it. I also just find Prospero a really interesting character, and I really love Ariel. So as for how I found this play, I started reading it when I was 13. It was the second Shakespeare play I read, and I read it in the summer before grade 8. I hadn't studied any Shakespeare in school yet, but I just found that I loved it, so I wanted to read it. I think I read it... I'm not sure if I read it once or twice all the way through, but then I spot read it like crazy in that summer. And then I kind of was off and on looking at it for the next couple of years, but didn't really study it in depth again until grade 12, when I was able to read it in my English literature class, which was really, really nice. I, like, I love reading Shakespeare on my own, don't get me wrong, but there's something about reading it in a, in a setting with other people that is just amazing. I mean, it makes sense because the, they're plays. They're not novels. They're not really meant to be read on your own. They're meant to be read in or they're meant to be performed. So reading them in a group 
brings you a bit closer to that than reading it on your own would. One thing that's kind of notable about this play is that there's really only one confirmed female character in the script, and that's Miranda, Prospero's daughter. But she is, I would say, quite interesting. She comes across as very, very innocent and kind of helpless, but she definitely has moments of strength and kind of stepping out on her own, which makes sense because a lot of Shakespeare's heroines were like this. There's one speech where she directly confronts someone who attacked her. I don't want to say any more specifics on that. But she confronts him and basically tells him off. <laughs> speech is actually so direct and outspoken that some productions have reassigned the speech to her father because they didn't really like because they didn't think it fit this character. But I think it is something that you should incorporate into the character of Miranda because she can it shows that she can be very strong. We also see this in her relationship with Ferdinand, who is her love interest, or she's his love interest, depending on how you view it. I think I would say he is hers because she does seem to be the more, I guess, major role of the two, even though they're pretty equal. But she does this against her father's wi will, she go or against her father's wishes. She goes and talks to him and basically initiates this romantic relationship without permission. Actually, she's expressly against her father's wishes. Like, I've seen two performances of Miranda that stand out in my mind. The first was the first one I saw when I was 13. I really liked her performance, actually. I thought she did a good job. But I actually liked the one that I saw the other time better. I, I'm sorry, I don't know the actress's name, but it was in a filmed version of a Stratford in Ontario stage production of The Tempest. I believe Christopher Plummer was playing Prospero. And I really loved that version of Miranda because there were times when she could be very, very socially awkward, which made sense because she was raised on an island with basically no contact with anyone other than her father and one other person. So it makes sense that she wouldn't have the same societal behaviors that most people have. But she was very likable. She was really, really headstrong, but in a kind of understated way, which I really liked. So if you ever want to find a good version of The Tempest, that's actually the version I would recommend. I still need to see the Helen Mirren version. I can't believe I haven't seen it yet. But I do want to see that version because one looks good and two, Helen Mirren plays Prospero. So yeah, that's another another one I want to look at. But yeah, that's kind of my journey with The Tempest. It's one that I come back to periodically. I love the themes. I love the whole ambiance because it's very, very fantasy-y. I think Midsummer Night's Dream is probably the only one that ha that more dominantly feels like a fantasy. So yeah, really, really good play. And one last little like fact about this play, it was written in the like near the end of Shakespeare's career, and it's often considered to be either his actual last play or kind of his spiritual last play. The character of Prospero at times actually feels almost like an insert character for Shakespeare. Like not in a bad way, but like just the whole puppet master thing being in control of everything that's happening on the island very much feels like a playwright orchestrating their, their story. And then there's also a moment at the very end of the play where he says goodbye to something and basically saying end of an era. it's an end of an era. And that very much does feel like Shakespeare saying goodbye to his playwriting because again, very near the end of his career. Anyway, guys, thank you for watching. If you have any questions regarding The Tempest or if you just want to talk about it, feel free to mention it down below. I'm always happy to talk about it. And yeah, if you have any other comments or questions, please let me know. Have a lovely day. See you later.